Good night, Shabbos, everybody. First, I'd like to thank the sponsors for this week's Kiddush, which will be served tomorrow. And we do have hot chalant this week as well, served in individual packages, but it will be a hot chalant as well. The Eisenberg family, the Goodman family, the Johnson family, and the Marlin family, thank you all so very, very much. So this week, the portion of Lech Lecha begins the long and glorious story of the Jewish people. The first portion, Barashas, dealt with the creation of the world with Adam and Eve. The second portion dealt with Noah, the destruction of the world, the rebuilding of the world, the Tower of Babel. And today we begin, the Shabbos, we begin the story of Avraham. And it begins with Lech Lecha, travel, go to a new land, and you will be a father of a great nation. And early on in this first conversation recorded in the Torah, the Torah says the following verse. God says to Abraham, If you're not familiar with the Hebrew language, let me translate for you. And I will bless those who bless you. And the ones who curse you, I will curse. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed by you. It is such a powerful verse, because in it the Torah will go ahead and say that the world is being judged by how they behave towards the Jewish people. But everyone should know, going forward, that the ultimate mission and the purpose of there being an Avraham, a Yitzchak, a Yaakov, a Sara, Rivka, Rachaleya, a Jewish nation, a chosen people, is an order that it bring blessings to all the families of the face of the earth, in the very first communication, it couldn't state it any clearer. To begin with this week, with, with an analogy for you of the importance of this verse, being that many of you, not all, but many of you, have celebrated the championship of the Los Angeles Dodgers, I will begin with a baseball analogy, but using one of the Yankees, of course. So Babe Ruth, you've heard of him. Even if you're not a baseball fan, you heard of him from the chocolate bar. He hit 714 home runs, a record that stood for a very long time until Hank Aaron came along, and then some others came along after Hank Aaron as well. But there's one home run of the 714 that stood out more than the 714 home runs. And if you're familiar with baseball, you know which home run I'm talking about. It came during the World Series, October 1932 when he visited that day with an ill child. And he promised this child that he was going to hit a home run for him. And there he is playing in this World Series game. He comes up to bat. And not just that he has in mind that he promised this ill child he was going to hit a home run for him. He took his bat and he used his bat as a pointer. And he points to the outfield, to the center field wall, to exactly where he was going to hit this home run. So not just that he was going to hit a home run, he points to the spot and he says, I'm going to hit the next ball and I'm going to hit it there and I'm going to do it for you. And indeed, on the very next pitch, Babe Ruth hits a home run to center field to the spot where he pointed to. So what makes this home run different than the other 700 home runs that he hit? Because most home run hitters, they get up to the plate and just about every time they're up there, they know what their job is. They're trying to hit a home run. Most of the time, the good majority of the time, even for the great home run hitters, they're going to strike out because they're swinging with all that night and they're not trying to make just regular contact, but they're trying to make contact that would send that ball over the fences. And so they strike out a lot as well. What made this home run different is that he, he said this ball is going to be hit over there. 
So when you predict something before it happens, it's far more powerful than looking back and saying, yeah, I hit a home run. Why do I bring this up other than because I wanted to bring up a baseball story for this week? 3,700 years have passed since Abraham walked the earth. A lot of history has transpired since such broad sweeping and open projections and predictions were made. I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you, I will curse and all the families of the earth shall be blessed through you. And as he says a few verses later, for I have made you a father of many nations. These are the verses from this week's portion. So let's check, let's check on these verses thousands of years later. How did the author of the Bible do with his predictions? He predicted those who bless you, I will bless, those who curse you, I will curse, and I will make you a father of many nations and you'll bring a blessing, you'll bring blessings to all the families on the face of the earth. Let's take it from a different perspective. If it was a human being that authored the Bible, at whatever date in history, something I obviously do not believe happened, but suppose it was, he never would have included such an absurd statement in the name of God. Because if you go ahead and you make a prediction, and you say, God spoke to me, and God said this, and then it's proven that you're false, then ultimately the book is looked at with eyes of saying it's a book of fairy tales. So no human author will write something that history will tell you if it was true or not. And yet the Torah does not hesitate to state things openly and clearly about predictions and prophecies of the future. Only a God can take such a chance, only a God that knows the future. No human being would go ahead and say, all those that bless you, I will bless. All those that curse you, I will curse. All the families of the earth will be blessed. How do you know? How do you know? You would be a fool to put author this in your book, unless you really knew. And the only one that can possibly really know is God. You see, if you are authoring the Bible and you wanted people to believe it was God's work, so you, because the Torah says, I am writing it as the author, I am God. So the author clearly has to make believe that they're God. You wouldn't give yourself away by including information that will be easily proven false. You would want to write things that people can't disprove, but disprove. You stay neutral. And even if you're writing at a later period in history, Imagine during, imagine during the Babylonian or Greek conquest, if people believe that that's when this Torah was written, during the Babylonian era, someone went ahead and put this out there and said this was written by God. Why would you predict that all the nations of the earth will be blessed by this one Hebrew guy named Abraham? Suppose you made up a fictional name of Abraham, and that whoever blesses him is going to be blessed. You would never take such a chance. Not during any era would you take a chance and say, you see that man, it's all gonna be about him. You see that nation, it's all gonna be about that nation. That, that nation is gonna survive forever. Statistics would tell you you're insane to write such a thing, especially about the Jewish people, the most persecuted nation around. And yet, yet let's take a look, let's take a close look. How did we do with this verse, the verse of facts that God says to Abraham? Abraham, is held as the founder of the faith by three great monotheisms, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. All look to Abraham as the father of their faith. There are today 56 Islamic nations, there's over 80 Christian nations, and there's a Jewish state. So did Abraham become the father of many nations? Obviously, yes. Who could have predicted that? Whoever wrote this Bible, how could he predict this abnormal phenomenon of history? Think about it this way. The most influential man who will ever live, who will father a multitude of many nations, as I just pointed out, 50 Islamic, 86 Christians, right, plus a Jewish nation, 130 nations that will look towards Abraham as their father. And yet, during his lifetime, this character named Abraham, he ruled no empire, he commanded no army, 
He engaged in no spectacular act of heroism on the battlefield other than the, the war that takes place in this week's portion, but he wasn't a warrior. He wasn't a general. He wasn't someone that goes out to battle every day, right? He proclaimed no prophecy. He didn't go around saying, I speak as a prophet. I predict this and I predict that. He wasn't looking for that type of fame. All he did was trying to be kind and invite people into his house. His main disciple was his own, his own child. And yet today, more than half of the 7 billion people alive on the face of the planet identify themselves as part of the faith that came from this man, Abraham. No human being could have predicted this. And how about God's promise to Abraham that those who bless him will be blessed and those who curse him will be cursed? Let, let's take a look at that. Let's, let's focus on Spain. It was one of the world's mightiest powers. It was one of the most developed cultures in the 15th century. In 1492, it reached its zenith when it sent Christopher Columbus on a voyage that changed history. But in that same year, it also expelled all of its Jews. It intensified what we know as the Spanish Inquisition against the many forced Jewish converts to Catholicism. Spain then descended into a 500-year status known as the sick man of Europe. And it's never recovered its ancient glory. You could point to the time on the calendar. You expelled your Jews. You persecuted your Jews. You fell. Never recovered. Never recovered from it. Think about, think about Germany and Austria. They were hands down the cultural and intellectual centers of Europe, if not of the world before World War II. And then Germany, with Austrians' help, murders nearly every single Jew in Europe. Germany lost over 7 million of its people. It was divided for generations. And yes, while today it has recovered materially, culturally, Germany has become irrelevant. It's not that world power anymore. Let's not go back in, in, in ancient history. Let's think about the world today. Look at who most blesses the Jews and who most curses them. And you decide whether this verse of the Torah of this week's opening portion, or the opening of this week's portion, is perhaps one of the greatest historical truths ever told. Let's, let's look at the United States. Since its inception, it has been the most blessed nation to the Jewish people. It has given the Jewish people more freedom than any other country on the face of the earth throughout all of our history. It allows us to be Jewish openly, proudly. It doesn't persecute us for being Jewish. It welcomed us into this country. It has supported Israel. It has supported Israel not just in 1948, but since 1948, some administrations more than others. But by and large, America has been good to Israel. And it remains one of the most blessed countries in the history of the world. And it, it, it's a message clearly to any believing non-Jew that wants to become the president of the United States or be in the Senate or the House. If you truly believe and you read this verse and you see history, you know it to be the case. Be kind to the Jews, bless the Jews, make it a blessed land for the Jews, be good to Israel, and you will have blessings for your nation. The Torah said it years ago, thousands of years ago, and it has remained absolutely true throughout history. Let's look, let's look at the Arab world today. Look at the hostility that has come from the Arab world towards the Jewish people and towards Israel, and they're one of the same. Don't let them convince you that it's not. According to Arab scholars appointed by the United Nations to report on the state of Arab society, that part of the world lags behind the rest of humanity in virtually every social, moral, and intellectual indicator. It's, it's half-century long preoccupation with destroying Israel has only increased the Arab world's woes. They haven't benefited from it. And that's the reason today, while we're seeing this openly before our eyes in the last few months, that Arab nations are racing to make peace for, with Israel. And these peace treaties are different than the past. These are more real. These are peace for peace. It's not peace for surrender. It's not peace because if not, we're going to do this. It's peace for peace. Let's be friends. Why? Because it works. 
because peace for peace in the Middle East, to be peace with the Jewish people, peace with Israel is good for your own country. It's good for your own economy. It's good to build up your own nation. Israel has so much to offer and Israel makes for good friends. And you want to be friends with Israel. You want to be friends with the Jewish people. It brings blessing to your own people, to your own country. And the more they realize it, the more of such treaties we're going to see, one after the next. And look at those who did not embrace this. How are they doing? How is Syria doing today? Syria, who's been shaped, we're going to wipe Israel off the map, right? How are they doing? Has it brought blessings to their people? Has it increased the, the, the financial stability of that country? Has it brought any happiness to the people of Syria? All of this hate for the Jewish people and for Israel. What has happened to that country? Let's take a look at the Gaza Strip. What has that hate brought them? You look at any nation that is focused completely on hate and hate and hate. How are their people doing? What's it like for them? You think for, for a moment, what was life like for the average Iranian citizen before Ayatollah Khomeini came in with his Islamic fundamentalist teachings and hate for Israel and hate for the Jewish people and hate for the small Satan and the big Satan. How are they doing? How are they doing in the times of the Shah who had a wonderful relationship with Israel? How are they doing today? You look at any part of the world, we can make the exact same example and not just today, throughout history. This was the verse, this was the opening verse clearly said by God. You know, the Jews play, play this role for the world. And you've heard this example, I'm sure, before. The canary bird. The canary bird was always used by coal miners because they would take these canaries with them into the mines because canaries have extremely sensitive, they, they feel dangerous gases. And so those working in the coal mines needed to know, are their lives in, in danger? And they would bring these canaries in who would smell the gas right away. And if the canaries couldn't survive there, they knew this was not a place for them to be. So they respond to the danger before the coal miners did. So if the coal miners see the canary doesn't want to stay there, the canary is getting sick, the canary passes out, it's time to get out right away. Why am I talking about canaries? Because we, the Jewish people, are the world's, the world's early warning system. Where there is evil, where there is hatred, it always affects us first. If there is hatred anywhere in the world, it seems to find the Jewish people first. We are history's canaries. If there's evil somewhere in the world, we will become its target. People overflowing with hatred for whatever reason, including self-hatred, make us first. That is the role we've played in this world, to be the miners canary, to smoke out the bigots, the haters, the people who will become a menace to their communities and to their part of the world if someone doesn't stop them. And we, the Jewish people, seem to be very good at identifying them pretty early. If Jews are being cursed there, there's something corroded in that society, that society will not last. Hitler, Yamach Shemai, attacked Jews before he attacked Western civilization. And that should have alerted the world to what kind of person he was. But the world misread the signal. They thought he just didn't like Jews. You know, Muslim fanatics practiced the terrorist skills on Israelis before turning those skills on the rest of the world. But the world didn't look for the warning, didn't understand the warning, or chose to ignore the warning. Before 9-11, Israel suffered years of suicide bombings which murdered hundreds of Jewish men and women and children in, in pizza shops and in schools and on buses. But the world chose to say it's a Jewish problem, it's an Israeli problem. This is what God told Abraham early on, and it wasn't only a promise, it was a prediction of history. It was a fact of history. You want to understand culture? Look at how it treats Jews. If it blesses Jews, God says, I can promise you they are blessed. All people living there are blessed. If they curse Jews, if they discriminate against Jews, if they terrorize Jews, I can assure you, sooner or later their own people will suffer untold agony. Some of you that are on remember 1973. I actually remember it. I was 10 years old at the time. 
And you remember there was the Yom Kippur War. And following the Yom Kippur War, there was the Arab embargo on oil exports, on ex exports of oil to this country. And many, many Americans had to deal with this embargo. You remember what it was like to get gas for your car during those times? How many of you remember the odd and even license plates, right? Some days you were able to get gas, some days you couldn't get gas. And how long were those lines to get gas? You think in this pandemic that line for toilet paper was bad. You don't remember 73 blocks and blocks and blocks long waiting just to put gas in your car and only on certain days of the week. Gas rationing, how much you can put. And imagine what that will do to the economy. And as a result, some called for the abandonment of Israel. Why, why do we need to be allied with Israel? It's not helping us. Look what it's doing to us. You know, we need oil more than we need Israel. Oil prices skyrocketed. And there were bumper stickers that started appearing saying, we don't want Jews, we want oil. Vedigabetan, who needs this Israel? Who needs this alliance with Israel? What's it getting for us? We need the Arabs because we need their oil. So uh, enough of these Jews. So there was an article that was published by a Gentile. His name was William Icon. And his letter first appeared in the Colorado Springs Gazette. And then it was carried by one newspaper after the next until it appeared in 250 newspapers throughout America. And I'll just read you one paragraph from, from this article. This is during the Arab oil embargo of 73. He said, Jews go home. We do not want Jews. We want oil. That gets your attention, right? You see an article like that, you're going to read it. And then it continues. But before you leave, could you do us a favor? Could you leave behind the vaccine formula of Dr. Jonas Salk before you go? You wouldn't want our children to be paralyzed by polio, right? Will you leave behind the capability you have shown government in politics, your influential prowess, your good literature, your tasty food? Don't, don't take that with you. Le leave that behind. Please have pity on us. Remember, it was from you that we learned the secret of how to develop great men as Einstein and Steinmetz and many others who are of great help to us. We owe you a lot for the atomic bomb, for research satellites, and perhaps we owe you our very existence. Instead of observing from the depths of our graves how Hitler, old but glad, passes through our streets, relaxed in one of our Cadillacs, if he would have succeeded to reach the A-bomb and not us. And on your way out, Jews, could you do me one more favor? Could you pass by my house and take me with you? I'm not sure I could live a secure life in a land which you are not found. If at any time you will have to leave, love will leave with you. Democracy will leave with you. And essentially everything will leave with you. God will leave with you. So if you pass by my house, please slow down and honk your horn because I'm going with you. Well said. A man that read the Bible, a man that understood history, a man that understood the ultimate truth of that verse. You bless the Jewish people, you will be blessed. They will bring blessings to all the families on the face of the earth. That is their purpose of existence. I close with a thought on this verse by Rabbi Levi Yitzchak of Bardichev. And Rabbi Levi Yitzchak of Bardichev asked the question, if you go back to that original verse, it talks about those mekalelecha that curse you. And then to use the term, I will curse, he changes that word of mekalelach, and he uses a different word for curse. He uses the Hebrew word, or. Or means I will curse. But why did he change from that word, mekalel, to curse? And he switches to a different word to curse, or I will curse. And the answer of Levi Yitzhak of Bardichev says, was that Abraham was the prototype of love and kindness. His entire life was dedicated to helping humanity. 
He fought abuse. He fought oppression. He fought immorality. He hosted strangers. He fed them. It was so difficult to comprehend why anybody would ever want to curse such a person. Only one reason can justify such behavior, that the one who is cursing someone like Abraham is in the dark and doesn't know the true character of this individual, doesn't know the goodness and the kindness of this individual, doesn't know the blessings that will come to himself because of this individual. He has this fictional image of Abraham, fictional that has been fed to him, which allows him to spew venom against this kind man. So God tells Abraham early on, Mikalelecha, those that will curse you, or or means I will curse, but or also has the word, I will bring light. Should there be a person who will curse you, I will open their eyes and take them out of the darkness to see the light and to ultimately understand who you truly are. That's what we, the Jewish people, want more than anything else. We don't want the help that we can defeat our enemies. We want our enemies no longer to be our enemies, but are, are to see the light. Those who curse Jews today always destroy themselves. They destroy their societies in the process. And those who do not wish to stand up to those who curse Jews fail to realize that they're ignoring a danger to themselves that ultimately will come back to them. A society which has no room for Jews has no room for humanity. So we all have to be decisive and clear about this without apologetics. We have to always recall that so many human beings live in false stereotypes, confused and deceived. And we have to stand tall and stand strong and be proud of what it means to be a member of the chosen people. Don't hide from it. There's no reason to hide. It means we bring blessings to all the families on the face of the earth. Why would you want to hide that? And we seize every opportunity to help God fulfill this promise. Those who curse us, I will enlighten. And we've seen this, as I mentioned in past months, the birth of what is being called the Abraham Accords. New nations, nations that are suddenly making peace with Israel. New territory for Chabad houses. And by the way, they were there before the treaties were already signed. They smelled it before. Chabad has already offices in Dubai, and they'll have it in every single one of these countries as well. May it continue. Because the ultimate blessing for Abraham, the Abraham Accords, is that all of Abraham's children live together in harmony and in peace and recognize indeed the blessings that are the Jewish people. Shabbat Shalom, everybody. For those that will make it to shul, we're starting services tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. As I mentioned, Hanoch was here earlier. He made his famous Hanoch's Cholent. We're going to be treated to hot Cholent tomorrow. We look forward to having you daven with us. Monday evening at 7.30 is the class called Biblical Reflections. And Wednesday at 12.30, we continue on with the chosen people. Shabbat shalom, everybody.